Hello, everyone. It is Gary and Jeff coming at you with another installment just in time before 2020 is over. And while many people can't wait for 2020 to be over so that they can get back to normal in 2021, we know better because God and his word says otherwise. All right. So I've made this interesting observation that the church seems to be going through the same sort of process that the Israelites did during their exodus and wilderness wandering. So the exodus occurred on Passover. And then 50 days later, even according to the biblical text, was Mount Sinai when they received the law. And between those things was crossing the Red Sea and all that. But of course, they had their wilderness wandering for 40 years before they could actually enter the land that was promised to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob and to their descendants. And so for 40 years, they wandered the wilderness. They had to rely on God to provide their food. And uh, he made it so that their, you know, their sandals would remain intact for that 40 year long period. But think about the church age. Our Lord, our savior died on Passover. He was the Passover lamb. And then he rose again on first fruits. So we have our Passover through him. And then 50 days later, after first fruits was Pentecost. And we were collectively birthed, or you might say conceived on Pentecost. That's when the church began in Acts chapter two. And that was sort of a, a second giving of the law. This is the new law, the law of grace, the law of Christ. Whereas during the first exodus, 3,000 Israelites were killed because of their rebellion. If you recall, when Moses went up the mountain, he received the commandments on stone. He came down the mountain and they were worshiping this golden calf that Aaron had manufactured. And so 3,000 were killed. But there's a reversal of that. So on Pentecost, 3,000 are saved. The church is birthed or you might say conceived. And so that's how the church age began, but we're still here. We're still here for, we've been here for 2000 years. We're waiting on the imminent appearing of our Lord to take us home. And it occurred to me that this is 40 Jubilees, 40 Jubilees, 2000 years, 40 Jubilees. So whereas the Israelites were wandering for 40 years, the church has been in the wilderness still in, in the world, the wilderness of the world. We're freed from our sins in his blood, but we're still in these, these bodies of sin and death. We still carry this flesh with us, and we're looking forward to when we enter the promised land, heaven. We're actually looking to cross the heavenly waters. You know, In Genesis 1, it talks about how the Lord separated the waters that were above the firmament from the waters that were below. And so we're going to have a heavenly crossing of the Jordan River, so to speak, to enter heaven. But we've been here still. We're still stuck on this planet for 40 jubilees awaiting our deliverance. So there's clearly a typology between the Israelites and the church. And then Jeff pointed out 1 Corinthians 10 seems to kind of hint at this. So Paul writes to the Corinthian church, and I do not wish you to be ignorant, brothers, that all our fathers were under the cloud and all passed through the sea, and all were immersed into Moses in the cloud and in the sea, and all ate the same spiritual food and all drank the same spiritual drink for they were drinking of a spiritual rock following them. And the rock was the Christ. So Paul here recognizes Christ himself was with them. We're not just talking about the father. We're talking about the pre-incarnate son of God, but in the most of them, God was not well pleased for they were strewn in the wilderness. And those things became types of us. For are not passionately desiring evil things as also these desired. Neither become idolaters as certain of them, as it has been written, the people sat down to eat and to drink and stood up to play. Neither may we commit whoredom as certain of them committed whoredom, and there fell in one day 23,000. Neither may we tempt the Christ as also certain of them tempted and perished by the serpents. And there's an interesting typology right there again, there it is. war of the body with the serpents. Neither murmur, as also some of them murmured, and perished by the destroyer. 
And all these things happened to those persons as types, and they were written for our admonition to whom the end of the ages came. So that he who is thinking to stand, let him observe lest he fall. So I was thinking about this parallelism between the Israelites and the church and how we are experiencing our own Passover and Exodus and wilderness wandering and about to be crossing the Jordan into heavenly Zion, into our promised land. And I've observed that a lot of Christians, sometimes myself included, and I think the best admonition comes when you can be self-reflective, kind of start to question things where God has revealed so many things and he's been with us every step of the way. And he's shown us so much stuff and we've asked and we've prayed, Lord, show us more, show us more. And he's fed us and he's fed us and he's fed us day after day. And there's times when it seems like, you know, we go days or weeks, maybe even months without something huge and significant, but he continues to feed us and he has not failed to feed us in the wilderness. And so I would just encourage you not to back down, not to go back and think that everything he's shown us is incorrect or mistaken or misleading. No, he's been faithful and he's continued to show us more. And so I think this is something that's important is that we build on what he's shown us and not go back to the drawing board, so to speak, and throw everything out. But we we trust him and we keep taking steps, step after step. You know, he's preserving our spiritual sandals and he's shown us all these incredible things like the Revelation 12 sign and Prior to that, the blood moons, which started getting us awakened to signs in the heavens. And we have now what seems to be a much clearer understanding of the star of Bethlehem. And we've seen some practical solutions to what might have been the fulfillment of the second sign, the sign of the dragon in Revelation 12, 3 and 4. We've now seen the great conjunction. And I think we might be on the verge of a more accurate fulfillment of the astronomical depiction of Revelation 12, 5. That's when the child is birthed into heaven. I explained this in one of our previous videos, what could be an astronomical depiction of the sign of the dragon. And this image is something that I made a few years back in 2018, when there was this Drake and its meteor shower in October. And there were over a hundred shooting stars per hour over a pretty extensive period. And so I suspected that maybe this could have been the fulfillment of verses three and four of Revelation 12. And as Jeff pointed out, there was even this hurricane, Hurricane Michael, which was plowing through the Atlantic Ocean at this very time. So there's 88 constellations in the sky and all the ones that depict serpents or dragons are right here wrapped around Virgo and Leo. So you have the tail of Hydra. This is the constellation Hydra here, number eight. And it goes up and then you have cancer and lynx. So lynx is a newer depiction. We're not sure what the more ancient depiction could have been. It could have been some sort of serpentine thing. But if you envision that this serpent or dragon crosses through cancer and lynx, then you have the whirling serpent Draco. This is where the Drake and his meteor shower was. And then you have Hercules, which is often depicted in combat with a multi-headed serpent. And then down here, you can see just the top of his head, but Ophiuchus, who's always depicted in combat with a serpent, this seems to be a picture of Genesis 3.15, the promise that the Messiah would crush the head of Satan. And then, this just blows my mind, the constellation serpents right here, right at the feet of Virgo, right where she quote-unquote birthed Jupiter in 2017, is the constellation serpents with exactly seven principal stars, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, right here. And so you can envision this as just one giant serpent or dragon, and it's in Hercules where the heads begin to diverge, and you see these depictions of the Messiah in combat with the serpent, in combat with Satan. And then the seven stars of serpents represent the seven heads of the dragon. And then right above, the constellation Serpents is the constellation Corona Borealis, which also has exactly seven stars. And in Revelation 12, the dragon has 
seven crowns on his heads. In the Greek, the word for crown there is actually transliterated as diadem. That's a royal crown. And Corona Borealis is always depicted as a royal crown. Whereas we've shown, you know, in previous segment that Corona Australis, the one that Sagittarius, the rider on the horse, the first seal has, is a wreath or a garland. And that's how that's always depicted. And that's the crown that we see the Antichrist given in Revelation chapter six. I suspect that this may have been sort of a foretaste of the sign of Revelation 12, three and four, but it may have been more accurately fulfilled this month with the series of signs that we saw. And I'm gonna show that in Stellarium. But first I wanted to review something from my most recent article where I talk about how we should interpret signs in the heavens and what planets and stars and constellations represent. I think this could kind of be a good basis for maintaining some consistency and in interpretation. So I wrote, it should be noted that in biblical astronomy, certain characters can be represented multiple times. So for instance, Christ is a central figure and we see depictions of Christ throughout the sky. He's Ophiuchus in combat with Satan, He's the bright morning star of Venus, according to Revelation 22, 16. And he seems to also be represented by Taurus, the bull, the rampaging returning Lord at the end of the Great Tribulation. And he's also represented by Jupiter, the Bethlehem star, Christ incarnate in fleshly form. So and there, there may be more than that as well. So certain characters can be represented multiple times. And individual stars and planets tend to represent individuals. So for instance, Venus clearly represents Jesus Christ per Revelation 22, 16. So that says, I, Jesus, have sent my angel to testify to you about these things for the churches. I am the root and the descendant of David, the bright morning star. Bright morning star is a clear reference to the planet Venus. And then Jupiter represented Christ at his first coming where he wasn't yet glorified, he became incarnate, he became a servant. And we've pointed out before a lot of the symbols in Jupiter, how it has stripes, like he bore stripes and who's flogged, how it has the great red spot, like Jesus' spear wound and so forth, how it's the greatest planet, the king planet. So it represented Christ at his first coming and it represents the church at his second because we're still in our bodies, our fleshly bodies, our mortal bodies, and we're awaiting our glorification. And then we saw, of course, Jupiter doing the dance through Virgo's womb before the birth. And then Saturn, as we pointed out, represents Satan. Mercury represents Gabriel. Mercury in all the ancient mythologies was the messenger because it was the fastest planet from our vantage point as it moved through the sky. So it seemed to be the messenger to them. And so we can associate that with Gabriel. He's the angel that always delivers the messages. And then Mars some speculate could represent the red dragon and maybe there's some double fulfillment there, but I tend to think it represents Michael, the archangel. He's the warring angel, the prince of Israel, who is always depicted in combat in Daniel 10. He's in combat in revelation 12. He's in combat and he's fighting with Satan over the body of Moses as recorded in the new Testament. So those planets seem to represent and perhaps also individual stars, individuals, without really context beyond that. Whereas constellations tend to represent scenes from history. So for instance, Ophiuchus again, this is Genesis 3.15, Christ in combat with the serpent. Or Taurus, Jesus returning with power and glory, the second coming, and so forth. Or constellations could represent corporate entities. So Leo representing Judah. Virgo, which has 12 stars representing Israel, and then you know Taurus, the returning Christ, Ophiuchus, Christ in combat with the serpent, and so forth. And then, of course, Sagittarius, the Antichrist rising to power, which is the first seal listed in Revelation chapter 6. So keep that stuff in mind. And then going back to Saturn, I found something else pretty interesting. The planet Saturn happens to have seven traditionally listed moons and seven moons that are large enough to form spheroids or ellipsoids that are the major moons of Saturn. And they're the, the moons that are actually visible through a telescope. And not only does it have seven, so recall Satan is represented by Saturn and 
the dragon in Revelation 12 has seven heads. So here we see seven moons. And these moons are all named after titans in Greek mythology or giants. And titans seem to be a pagan parallel to the fallen angels. And giants seem to be a pagan parallel to the Nephilim, mythologically speaking. So the first moon is Titan. The second is Enceladus, which is a giant. So Nephilim. And then Mimas, Tethys, Dion, Iapetus, and Rhea. So we have seven that represent some collection of fallen angels and Nephilim. And they also, in a sense, represent the seven heads of the dragon. The red dragon is also the constellations that surround Virgo and Leo, as it is Saturn and the moons. All right, so let's one more time just run through the order of events that we saw, primarily beginning in 2016 with the insemination of Virgo. So you had Comet Borisov, which came out of the loins of Leo, implanted, so to speak, in the, in the womb of Virgo. At the same time, Jupiter entered the womb. So that was like the insemination or the conception of the child. And then in 2017, of course, the Revelation 12 sign with the nine stars of Leo and then Venus, Mars, and Mercury forming the 12 star crown on her head. She's clothed in the sun. Jupiter's coming out of the womb after that nine month rotation through her womb, which included a retrograde. And then the moon is under her feet. And also to add to your point, Gary, about being consistent with the planets at this point um, at the uh, revelation 12 sign from our last video, we noted that Saturn is just looming, crouching, and it actually looks like it's under the feet of Ophiuchus. And that seems to be pretty consistent, right? Saturn, there he is. I mean, just like the picture is given to us in the beginning, Genesis three 15, that, the redeemer would be crushing the the head of the serpent and point the point i was trying to make was the consistency like you were saying with mars for example like some were saying well that could be the dragon has a negative association actually the revelation 12 sign is evidence that mars has a more positive association because there we have all these positive stars in alignment venus mars and mercury so truly this seems to add further weight that, you know, hey, don't discount the whole Michael Mars theory because there's Satan is down there while you have all these other stars in alignment that are just in battle formation that they're forming the heavenly crown. They're the holy angels as opposed to the fallen. Yeah, that's a really good point too because it's Christ. Theoretically, Michael, Mars, and then Gabriel, Mercury, and then, you know, the King Star Regulus and the other eight principal stars of Leo. So that's a really good point because, like Jeff said, like I showed, Saturn is being crushed under the heel of Ophiuchus. So that's a picture of Genesis 3.15 as Virgo is giving birth pictorially to Jupiter. And then as I was discussing a few moments ago, October... 2018 was a theoretical fulfillment of the second sign depicted in Revelation 12. And I still think that's a very valid possibility. But one thing to keep in mind is that the meteors that were coming down, the Draconids, are over here. So not necessarily the tail area of the dragon. There were a lot. There was roughly 150 shooting stars coming down per hour. And over the course of that meteor shower, it could have been that there was roughly the same number of shooting stars that appear to fall to Earth as there are stars in the sky or stars that are visible to us on Earth in the sky. But when we fast forward to this year, to December 14th, which was seven days before the Great Conjunction, and it's the same day as the great solar eclipse that went over Patagonia all the way across South America, the land of the giants. And it happened right in the middle of the two great American solar eclipses, the one in 2017, 2024. So this day was sort of marked. It was almost like X marks the spot. 
on this day, Jupiter is getting really close to Saturn seven days before the conjunction. So it's like the dragon standing ready to devour the child. And as we've pointed out, Sagittarius is a perfect depiction of the Antichrist and the first seal. In Capricorn is the horned goat or Baphomet. And so he's right there. Saturn is right here at his mouth area. It's almost as if he's ready. He's waiting to devour the child. And on the same day that the dragon is appears to be staying ready to devour the child, there was another significant meteor shower, the Geminids right here. And if you recall from that picture that I showed of what could be the constellation pictorial of the great red dragon with the seven heads of serpents and the seven crowns on his heads, the Geminids is along the tail. So the tail would go here, the body is up here with Draco, and the Geminids, the official numbers just came out, and there were, on average, I think about 166 shooting stars per hour for a pretty extensive period. It's a multi-day shower, and over the course of this whole shower, again, it could have appeared that approximately one-third of the stars, the visible stars in the sky, fell to the Earth in terms of the number of shooting stars. And this was actually along the tail of the dragon pictorial. But there were also other meteor showers that were smaller ones that were occurring along the tail or in the vicinity of the tail. So you had the Leonis Menorids and the Comae Berenices. And there's also the Monocerotids and the Hydrids. So these were all roughly along the tail of the dragon on this day. And then the Great Conjunction on 1221 the closest conjunction in 400 years, but the closest conjunction that was visible from Earth in 800 years. And this is the climactic moment. Will the child escape or will the child be devoured by the dragon? You can see from the signs in the heavens that things have really been building up to this crescendo, the moment when we're going to see whether or not the dragon is going to be successful or whether the child escapes. So we've been building to this moment over the past several years, what's going to happen? So now I've changed it to where you can see the horizon. This is the vantage point from Jerusalem, looking roughly southwest, looking shortly after sunset. And that's the Great Conjunction. And then Saturn hits the dirt. And Jupiter is now beyond the grip of Saturn. And here comes Mercury, again, the messenger. We know from 1 Thessalonians that an archangel cries out. So this could be significant also that Mercury is prefacing what's about to happen. And now here comes the sun. This is in the evening now before sunset. The sun's getting closer and closer to Jupiter. Up to this point, Jupiter is an evening star. And now looking shortly before sunset, the sun is approaching Jupiter, passes Saturn. And up to this point, Jupiter has been an evening star and not a morning star. That means that if we were to flip the horizon, it would appear as if the sun rises before Jupiter. So you wouldn't see Jupiter in the morning. Jupiter is still an evening star, but it's about to cross Jupiter. So technically speaking, Toward the end of January, Jupiter becomes a morning star. And then shortly after Jupiter becomes a morning star, we see Venus approaching. That's the bright morning star. That represents Christ. So watch this. Venus is rising, and the apparent velocity of Venus, from our vantage point, the speed at which it seems to be traveling across the sky, is faster than the sky is setting. So Venus appears to be ascending even at night when the sky is setting. So it's rising, it crosses Saturn, it goes past the depiction of Satan. And then what happens next? Saturn hits the dirt and Jupiter and Venus conjunct. So there's been conjunctions of Venus and Jupiter every year. It happens every year because Venus goes all the way around the ecliptic I think even more often than once per year, but which of those conjunctions is significant in terms of the Revelation 12 narrative? This could be it. 
This is after the great conjunction, after possible depiction of Revelation 12, 3 and 4, and the dragon standing ready to devour. And now Jupiter has been glorified, so to speak, becoming a morning star, and Venus has come up to conjunct. This could be a picture of Christ meeting the church in the air as Satan, a.k.a. Saturn, is cast out. And from this point forward, we know from 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 that we will always be with the Lord. We'll never be separated again. And like I mentioned, Venus appears to be traveling faster than the sky is setting. So Venus won't hit the dirt. <laughs> it just keeps ascending, 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 up, 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 up. So that could be from the astronomical perspective, the conclusion of the signs in the heavens in terms of the first five verses of Revelation 12. So we've seen the conception, 2016. We've seen the pregnancy, the great bulk of 2017. And then the woman in labor, the great sign of Revelation 12 in September of 2017. And then a very good depiction, in my opinion, of Revelation 12, verses 3 and 4, the dragon having cast down a third of the stars of the sky and standing ready to devour the child. That would have been December 14th of this year and the great conjunction and the, sub the days after that. And then now Revelation 12, 5, the picture may occur this upcoming February. So I thought that was kind of interesting, something to consider. And again, like it does not mean that the rapture is going to happen on February 11th or 12th or whatever, but I think it shows that we're getting to crunch time. We're getting really close to the climactic moment where God is going to act and he's fed us so far and he's been faithful. And so we're not going to shrink back in unbelief. We're not going to be like the Israelites were in their 40 years of wandering when they questioned and doubted and eventually got to the point where they said, maybe we should just go back to Egypt. At least we had, we had bread and we had stew and the Lord doesn't want that from the church. And there's a lot in the church that are questioning everything and picking everything apart and wanting to go back to the drawing board. But I say, live in the tension of what God has shown. It's okay. Live in the tension of what we're seeing, what God has revealed collectively to the body. Be open to it. He's showing so many things. It's unbelievable. And we can take that walk by faith. He's going to show us more. And our departure is really soon. Well, thank you, Gary. Thank you again. I always like it when Gary can navigate through his delirium and it's been really helpful. It really is helpful to get the visual. So as you're reading along with revelation 12 and you're starting in verse one and we're just, you know, <laughs> the time it's taken us to get to this point has been slower than it takes to actually read the passage. So <laughs> we got to keep that in mind, right? Cause at first we were wanting we were wanting the actual event of the resurrection and rapture to occur as fast as we can read the passage. But as we've seen with the narrative that God is telling in the heavens, it's taken a little more time, a little more time to get to where we are now. It is a crescendo. It is building. We're getting to the climactic end and a good time right now to be talking about resolution as people are thinking about New Year's resolutions. Well, I believe that with what God has shown us, we are at the resolution, at least for the wilderness wandering that Gary's talking about, this type that Israel has shown us with the wilderness wandering and the historical uh, exodus where we've now got our own wandering that is coming to an end. It is about to be resolved. So, and just as you saw where Gary was showing you where, where Jupiter becomes the morning star and Venus conjuncts there in February, just remember that every believer in Christ, everyone who is putting their faith in the Son of God who, who died for their sins is a child of the day, whether they're living like it right now or not. And that can be frustrating. For many of us, where we may have even known someone who at one point was really on fire for the Lord, even someone who may have been really into studying the end times and really believing that we were right there, but they lost hope. And they said, enough of this stuff, you know, enough of the numbers, enough of the planets, 
uh, <laughs> enough of you guys. <laughs> but you know what? Go easy on them. In fact, don't even go so far as to say they've fallen away or they've somehow lost, you know, God forbid you, you think that, you know, you could be in a position to make a judgment call saying they somehow they've lost their, their salvation. On the one hand, you've got crowns and rewards, but on the other, it's another thing to, to accuse someone of, uh, because they're not awake, that they could possibly have uh, forfeited their salvation or even going in the rapture. That somehow now they've been reduced to some uh, second tier status and they've got to somehow prove themselves after the trumpet sounds. So this, uh, this point about clarity and really what it means uh, for the body, the entire body of Christ, we've got some who are asleep, some who are awake, but the entire body is going, is going when, when the Lord descends and that archangel does shout and the trumpet sounds and the dead are raised and we who are alive are snatched away and Revelation 12, 5 is fulfilled in real time. Whether someone is is putting their, their head in the sand right now and they don't want to even look at all the things that are coming out that are previewing the coming tribulation period. They don't want to hear about um, all the things that people are speculating right now that, as we know, are saying, yes, yes, the tribulation is, is at the door. The day of the Lord is at the door. Okay, to really cement... What I'm trying to say here about the entire body is going in the resurrection and rapture of the church, which is before the day of the Lord. It is pre-tribulation. I want to go to an article that I discovered recently. I was actually looking for another one, <laughs> and I couldn't find it. It was by Zane Hodges. He did a great article on First Thessalonians 5. He also affirmed the point I wanted to make. But I found this article that was written in 1979 in the Journal of the Evangelical Th uh, Theological Society. It's by a guy named Thomas Edgar. And he, it's very brief. I mean, in fact, it's only six pages of this PDF. The title of it, The Meaning of Sleep in 1 Thessalonians 5.10. And he goes on to say, you know, there are some word studies that people do that you know, you might think are more worthy of a pursuit of time and resources than others. And some might think the word sleep would not be worthy of a deep study. But actually, when you look at First Thessalonians chapter 4, the verses that mention sleep, like, for example, First Thessalonians 4, uh, 13, where Paul says that he didn't want the Thessalonians to grieve as those who had no hope about those who were asleep, those who had died. So there, the term for sleep is referring to believers who literally died and they were no longer living. So there's one usage of sleep, but there's another usage of a different Greek word. And the one in 413 is kamao, uh, the one in First Thessalonians chapter 5 is Cthudo, which in our English Bibles could be translated the same as sleep, but you wouldn't know the difference if you were just reading the English. But if you, if you go into the Greek, you'll see that Paul deliberately uses two different Greek words. So the Greek word he uses for sleep in chapter 4 in reference to the dead in Christ who are going to be raised, is different than this word Cthudo. And so this author comes to the conclusion after his, his study through the Greek Old Testament and how it's used in the New Testament, these two words, Kumao and Cthudo, he comes to this conclusion. He says, there seems to be a developing distinction between kamao and kathudo in biblical usage. The verb kamao 
in addition to its basic meaning of sleep, is used frequently in the Greek Old Testament to refer to death. While kathudo is seldom used for death, but in the great majority of instances refers to sleeping or lying down. And the New Testament continues this distinction even more clearly. So kamao in the New Testament is consistently used in reference in contexts that talk about literal death. And while there's no instance in the New Testament where Cthudo has this idea, apparently the authors of the New Testament were influenced by the LXX, the Greek translation of the Old Testament. And so they built upon even the Lord's use of the terms in John 11, 11 and Matthew 26, 45. The early church also used kamao to refer to death as a euphemism, especially for believers, while reserving kathudo to mean sleep. Okay, what's the big idea? Why even go into this distinction? Well, here, here's the application, and I'm going to post these later to the article. But in summary, he's basically saying kathudo does not mean physical death in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. So where does this, where does this come into to relevance? Well, if you look at 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, it's right after Paul talks about the resurrection and rapture. So even the arrangement shows you, hey, in Paul's mind, what comes first? Resurrection, rapture, and then what comes later? Oh, the day of the Lord begins. But Paul says that believers in Christ, the body, they are not appointed to this time. Basically, he says, you're, you're children, you're sons of the day. You're not of the night or the darkness. And so he's saying, because this is who you are now, because of this unseen reality that you've been changed, you've been born again, you've been bought by the blood of Christ, you are not your own. Okay. All the theology from his other letters you apply here. He says, okay, don't, then don't live like a child of, of the night anymore. Sadly, we know some do. Sadly, those who are genuinely children of the day, who are supposed to live like they're a child of the day, don't. They become intoxicated again with the world. They begin to adopt a worldly mindset, and they reject this notion that Christ is coming, and coming so soon as we know he is. They're rejecting all these signs altogether. They, they're dismissing them. And so Paul's saying, no, don't do that. Don't sleep. Be watchful. Be sober. He says, those who sleep, this is Cthudo now. So he's not saying those who are physically dying sleep by night and get drunk. Okay, the dead don't get drunk. He's saying those who are Cthudo are getting drunk, meaning they're getting caught up in the world again. Their mind is not set on being immediately transported to heaven. He says... That we, though, who are children of the day, have a hope of salvation. Why? Because God did not appoint us to wrath, to anger. And this is a specific time of anger, specific time of wrath, because the context says it's the day of the Lord. We are appointed to salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ, who died for us, that whether we are Gregorio or whether we are Cthudo, we may live together with him. This is where this word study distinction comes into play right here in 1 Thessalonians 5.10. This is why it matters. Because 1 Thessalonians 5.10, when properly interpreted, means Christ, who died for us, we're appointed to salvation through Christ who died for us, that whether we watch or whether we fail to watch, we shall live together with him. This verse is contrary to a concept such as the partial rapture, which so many are prone to teach whether they realize it or not. They may not say that they're teaching partial rapture, but they imply it. They're careless with their terms. They're not clear. But 1 Thessalonians 5.10 emphatically by this word distinction means that the body 
will go together. Okay. Whether your friend enjoys end time study as much as you do or not. If they are blood bought, if they are a child of the day and they believe that Jesus' death has paid for their sins in full, then they're going. They may be reluctant. It'll be kicking and screaming, but it's, you know, they're getting snapped. <laughs> it's going to be a shocking thing for them. But look at what he says. He says, rather, it expresses the blessed hope that all believers, spiritual or not, will be caught up to meet the Lord when he comes for his church. Whether we live properly or not, we will be with him. Believers are exhorted to watch. But watchful or not, Paul assures Christians that their hope is certain. So it doesn't hinge. You see what I'm saying? The resurrection rapture does not hinge on whether our brother Johnny or our sister Sally wakes up in time or not. They may not get time to wake up. So I bring this up. This has been on my heart. I think because so many of us, we know several people who are not watchful, we ourselves sometimes, especially those of us who have been really tracking with the signs, you may become prideful. You know, you may have a tendency to look down upon someone else who doesn't know as much, doesn't know the signs as well. So you may consider yourself more woke and therefore maybe be a little puff, a little puffy. So this actually neutralizes that and say, hey, stay humble. It goes back to the one who died for us. Oh, it goes back to the hope of our salvation, which is the Lord Jesus Christ. Yeah, that's good, Jeff. That's our hope that Jesus saved us. He died for our sins and rose again. He is our hope. He's our righteousness. He's our faith. He accomplished everything, including qualifying us to cross the heavenly Jordan into heaven. So yes, there is no partial rapture of the body. The baby is not going to be spliced in half <laughs> like Solomon suggested for the baby. <laughs> and, you know, that's not what's going to happen. This male child is going all the way up collectively. We are the promised seed of Abraham, according to Galatians 3.29. So we are one with Christ with the mystical body and the body is not going to be divided. Jesus' bride is not going to be cut up and part of her goes into the tribulation and part of her goes to heaven. That's not, that's not the deal. Right. And that's, that's why we have terms like tribulation saint. Term, that's why we have a term like Trinity. Though you won't find that exact term in the Bible, it's for clarity's sake. It doesn't mean it's not true. It doesn't mean we're delusional misguided coming up with these terms or adding you know it just means that we're taking the concept that the holy spirit is communicating and we've codified it with these terms to be clear for clarity's sake so that it makes the difference between a, a good shepherd and a bad shepherd a good shepherd like the apostle paul is going to be encouraging and seeking to build up mm -hmm. and even the weak those who are fallen off the wagon to try to get them back on, not to try to do as some might and, you know, just write them off altogether and say they're not important. So clarity is important. And there's a lot of messaging that people are hearing from the Christian community, which is not in any way effective at bringing the fish in. So we're supposed to be delivering the good news and they hear this twisted, mixed up, corrupted form of good news that is really not good news at all. And so they're like, well, what, what is attractive about that? Christianity is supposed to be a beautiful thing. The gospel is a beautiful thing. It's the best news ever that's been delivered. That not only is our entire record of wrongs nailed to the cross once and for all, no ifs, ands, or buts about it, but Jesus extends his own righteousness imputes it to our account we get to go to heaven sit with him on his throne rule over the nations with him 
live for eternity with him, rule over the universe with him, everything you could imagine at his right hand or pleasures forevermore. In him, our ancestors trusted and were not disappointed. And what's coming for us, what we're about to experience in heaven, and there's really no thing that can really compare to this. Like we have no context for it. What does it even mean to be raptured into heaven? We have, we have no idea. Like we, we believe by faith in something we cannot see. And that's a challenging thing to do sometimes. We know it's going to happen. We're certain of it. It's not a blind faith or an irrational faith. It's reasonable. It's logical. It's well thought out. It's solid scripture, but we can't see it. And so we walk by faith. We trust in, we trust in the promises of Christ that he gave us, that he's gone to prepare a place for us. And as hard as it is to believe, we're about to be standing in the presence of the Lord in glory in the heavenly Zion, surrounded by a myriad of angels and receiving everything that our heart could imagine. You know, that's, mm. that's the promise and it's good news. And we should deliver that good news so that we can reel the fish in before mm -hmm. the door of the ark closes. Amen. Amen, brother. Well, speaking of uh, reeling in and, and making resolutions, how does one resolve a video like this anyway? I don't know how to say goodbye. Well, then don't. 